Okay, karma. Now we start on karma, one of the most interesting subjects in Buddhism in which usually tons of questions are being asked about this topic. So let's see what karma is and let's firstly give a real life example. Okay, what determines a successful business firstly? Let's ask ourselves. Is it random events? Is it luck? Good luck? Bad luck? Is it fate? Is it our destiny to have a successful business or to fail in business? Is it the will of God that we are successful or we fail? Which of this determines a successful business? Or is it hard work? Is it market research? Is it innovation, flexibility, perseverance, context, team spirits, customer care? So which of these determines a successful business? Let's go into karma. Karma literally means intentional action. And this refers to the Buddhist belief in the principle of cause and effect. So that is, every intentional act will give rise to a corresponding result in either the present life or a future life when conditions are right. So karma means the actions that we do intentionally, actions of our body, actions of our speech, even actions of our mind. So these actions will produce results in the future when conditions are right. So the results of karma are not rewards or punishments. The results of karma are simply the results or outcome of intentional acts. Positive actions will eventually result in positive consequences. Negative actions will eventually result in negative consequences. That's all karma is cause and effect. Very simple, nothing much more than that. Therefore, a successful business is simply the result or the effect of several positive intentional actions or causes. So these intentional actions, like I said, hard work, perseverance, market research, <coughs> taking care of your customers, these actions increase the probability of a business being successful because these actions create the conditions for the success of the business. So obviously you take care of your customer, you develop good business contacts, you train up your staff, you don't give up, you persevere, you work hard. These are simply the results of your actions and the karma of the, the actions that you have taken. Nothing more than that. So for the successful business, karma is success. So therefore there's no need to rely on random events, no need to rely on luck. We don't depend on the will of a God and it's certainly not fated because what we do is within our hands. So once we know what to achieve, we simply create the conditions. And this is what is important. You know what we want to do? We create the conditions. Like a person wants to be successful in business, he lays down the conditions to being successful in business. A student wants to do well in school, he or she lays down the conditions to be successful in school by working hard, going to lectures, going to study groups, mixing around with friends who are able to help each other. If that student doesn't lay down these conditions, if the student doesn't study hard, cuts classes, spends time in the internet cafes, the result will be failure. Simple as that. So karma is simply the results of your actions. So once we know what to, we want to achieve, simply create the conditions. Like for many of you here, you want to know Buddhism, you want to know more about the Dharma. What are the conditions to be more knowledgeable in Buddhism? Well, the 10 talks like this, read more books, practice, these are the conditions that will result in your being knowledgeable about Buddhism. You will never be knowledgeable about Buddhism by sitting at home. You will not be knowledgeable about Buddhism by you know, spending time in, in, in the pubs or whatever. You will be knowledgeable in Buddhism by creating the conditions to be knowledgeable in Buddhism. So the point is, it is up to us to determine our own karma. So like someone we were talking just now about all this uh, fortune telling and all that. Uh, so it is up to us that even though we may have brought some previous bad karma from our past life, it can be changed. So even though we have good karma from the previous life, we can ruin it in this life. If we have brought bad karma from our previous life, we can improve it in this life. So it is up to us to determine our own karma. Some people ask, where is karma stored? It is not stored anywhere. Karma is simply the potential results that arise when conditions are right. So for example, a tree growing from a seed. Where is a tree in the seed? You can't find a tree in the seed. 
The tree will only arise when the conditions are right. When you plant the seed in soil, in a fertile soil, when there's sunlight, when there's water, then the tree will arise from the seed. If the conditions are not right, if there's no water, there's no soil, there's no sunlight, the tree will never emerge. So the tree is a karma, it will arise when conditions are right. Simply that. So, as I mentioned, the success of the business is not thought anywhere. Right? Where is the success of the business thought? The success arises only when the right conditions come into place. So, for example, you have all the conditions in place. Then, one day, you meet a good business contact. He puts you in touch with this other contact. You cut a deal, and that deal makes you a lot of money. But prior to that, you must have the business contacts. You must have the right conditions in place. Your company must have a good reputation. If not, your contact would not have referred you to these business deals. So, karma is not thought anywhere. It arises only when the right conditions come into place. The other question people like to ask is, who or what determines why it means this karma? Is it a great being out there who keeps a score, who keeps track of what we do? You know, today Brother Lee does all these bad things. Okay, now time to, for him to be punished. Let's punish him. Okay, maybe some time ago Brother Lee did some good actions. Let's reward him today. Maybe there's some being out there who takes care of karma. No, nothing and no one takes care of karma. Karma is simply the natural effect of intentional actions. That's it. Nothing determines a tree growing from a seed when there is soil, moisture and sunlight. This is just the natural process when the seed is being planted and when there is soil, moisture and sunlight. That's all. That's karma. So same for the successful business as we have seen. Nothing determines or evinces the karma of that business. It only comes into place when that businessman or when that group of people run their business properly and lay down the conditions for successful business. So not everything is due to karma. There are other laws of nature which govern our existence and these are the five causal laws of nature. So these are number one, the physical inorganic laws. These are the laws of physics like weather, climate, earthquake, things like that. These are the physical or inorganic laws. And the other one is the physical organic laws, like biological laws, genes, DNA. These are governed by the physical organic laws. The third law of nature is the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. This is the fourth one called the law of the norm. It deals with those greater phenomena like the gravitation. Finally is the law of the mind or psychic laws. So this governs how our mind works, the process of our minds. The process of our rebirth, the process of our consciousness, our, th our thoughts, our mental states, so on and so forth. So karma does not determine everything. We are subject also to these laws of existence. So like just now we mentioned, the person may be born in an earthquake zone. And if he dies in that earthquake, well, it is just due to this law of nature. Not necessarily due to karma, but maybe because of one of these laws of nature. Simply that. So karma is carried over from life to life and these will come into effect when the conditions are right. Therefore the way we lead our lives now determines the type of karma that will arise not only in this present life but our future life too. So this is important because what we do now affects our present life and it also affects our future life. So we should be more careful of what we do because there will be effect sooner or later. So the idea is to create more positive karma and less negative karma. Obviously, if you make a lot of negative karma and just a bit or no positive karma, then there will be more conditions for bad things to arise. If you do a lot of good things, you stay out of trouble, well, you will have better conditions for your life. I mean, for example, a person who goes drinking all the time, gets drunk, drives home, obviously, very easy for bad things to come into his life, right? So he may be caught for drink driving, he may get into a fight. These are bad things. Sir. So these are the results of negative karma. But on the other hand, you know, a person who keeps his precepts, his moral precepts, we go into this the lesson after next. Well, there's less chances of negative things or bad things happening to him. Now. Quite simple. Now. So create more positive karma and less negative karma. So how do we create positive karma? We do more good things, we avoid evil things, and we cultivate our minds. The first one is obvious, do good things. 
avoid doing those things. I mean, one good example is this. All of us have friends, right? So we have our circle of friends. If we treat our friends in a nasty way, if we are mean to them, eventually, one or two of them in the near future will come back and treat you badly. You never know. But on the other hand, if you treat all your friends very nicely, and when you need help in the future, for sure, some of your friends will come back and help you. So this is nothing much more than karma. Because you have treated people nicely, some of them will eventually come and treat you back nicely. If you treat people mean, you're nasty to them, you hurt them, some of them are bound to come back and hurt you sooner or later. And isn't that your negative karma? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, let's say someone is very genuine, but you say do good, avoid evil, evil. and then uh, meet a, a fellow colleague or somebody you know within the working. So you help them. But this guy backstab you and you lost your job. Okay, the brother asked this question. Uh, what about the situation whereby you treat people in general, uh, colleagues, whatever the case may be, nicely, mm-hmm. and then they stab you in the back and uh, you lose your job? Uh. No, you, you actually train this person up to manager level. And then he just kind of backstab you and, and you, because he likes your job, so you lose your job. Okay, la, fair enough. La. Okay, so this uh, brother is asking you train somebody up, you're nice to them, you help them in the best manner possible, right? And then they come in, they stab you in the back, and then they take over your job. Okay, this may or may not be due to karma. The thing is that it doesn't matter. You just go on treating people well. If they stab you in the back, well, it may be due to other conditions we do not know. I mean, people generally explain in a manner that maybe in the past life you did something wrong to you, so therefore this life he comes back to do something wrong to you. La. But let's put that aside for the time being. La. Okay, he may have come to step you in the back. It's hard to explain, right? Okay, but the thing is that you try to do your best as a human being. I mean, some things uh, you may not know the future. This guy may step you in the back, you lose your job. But who knows, you may even find a better job. Uh. So just coming back to the point about treating people badly and uh, treating people well and then they treat you badly, sometimes it happens. It is hard to explain that the brother said sometimes it may be worse. We don't know. But then it is up to us whether we want to do good things or not. Sometimes good things is his own reward. But the thing is, yes, I agree with you, some people you treat them well, they may step you in the back. But then this is part of life, this is part of something you accept. Sometimes you can take of it as a learning experience also. Because like in Buddhism, some people say, these people are your teachers. The people who stab you in the back, the people who frustrate you, the people who make you angry. If you do not have these people, uh, how are you going to cultivate your patience? How are you going to cultivate your perseverance? It's very easy to practice if everything goes well. It's only when you come across these things, then you know yourself. What kind of a person are you? Whether you are really upright or not. Fine. You may do good for a while and then this person sabotage you and then you turn around and then you become mean to everybody else. So what does that make you? It doesn't make you anything much, right? Then you, what's the big deal about your doing good things? Nothing. But on the other hand, if this person treats you badly and all that, uh, and yet you can maintain your uprightness, your morality, your generosity, uh, you can still practice and uh, then you have achieved something. Then you are different. That means you have learned something. That means you have overcome a hurdle in your life. If everything nice, so what? Who do not to practice? It's these things which make you a better person. That's why these people are actually your teachers. That's why in Buddhism we believe. So don't look at it on the surface only. Look at it, take it from a deeper angle. This is how you genuinely cultivate patience, forgiveness, things like that. Like um, someone I know, somebody screwed him up, cheated him. Lah. So this person, I said, let go. Lah. Say no, he's going to put him in jail. Which is easier to let go and forgive or to go and prosecute that person? Of course, prosecute that person is easy, right? Because it's in the human nature, you want to take revenge. Huh? But if that person can genuinely let go, huh? I tell you, that person really developed to a very high level. That person has learned forgiveness and patience. So these people, huh? if you look at it at, at a deeper level, these people are your teachers. Treat this sometimes as learning opportunities. Patience is one thing which makes your life better. And patience and forgiveness are two qualities which are extremely difficult to cultivate. But if you can cultivate, I guarantee you, you will be a really much better person. In your life, you will be really, really much easier and much better. So coming back to the subject, creating positive karma. 
do good, avoid evil, cultivate our minds. This is no more than the practice of generosity, morality and meditation. So meditation is important because meditation helps us to see things more clearly, helps us to calm our minds, develops patience. Okay, so these are the three things in Buddhism which enables us to create positive karma and also lay down better conditions for our present life and also our future life. So other things which help us to create positive karma are the 10 meritorious actions, the 38 blessings, etc, etc. And this will be covered in a couple of lessons from now. Uh, these are also in my book, The Life of Blessings, so you know you can look through first. I will be referring to that book in the next lesson uh, when we cover this. Okay, now we go into the technical aspects of karma, go a bit into karma, because karma isn't just simply karma, there's different aspects of karma. There's morally good or positive karma, there's morally evil or negative karma, and in very few cases, certain rare cases, there's neutral or neutral karma. That means you don't really produce any karma from your actions. And these actions arise from intentional actions of body, speech and mind. Okay, take note of this uh, word intentional. Uh. Because in Buddhism, karma arises from intentional actions. If you do something accidentally or without intention, there's no karma being produced. So it's a different from the legal system. Because for example, if you, okay, if you accidentally hit somebody when you're driving, but without any intention to do so, strictly speaking, that carries no karma because it wasn't an intentional action. You had no intention to injure that person. But in real life, of course, you're subject to the law. So that's a bit different. So the key point is that in Buddhism, karma arises from intentional actions. This also differentiates the Buddhist concept of karma from the Hindu and Brahministic concept of karma. In the Hindu concept of karma, karma arises from all actions of body, speech and mind, whether intentional or not. That's why it's like some of these uh, traditions, the Jain tradition, they take very great care when they walk. They sweep the floor before they walk on the path because they do not want to accidentally step on insects. They strain their water because they do not want to hurt you know, those small organisms. So this is one differentiating aspect about karma between Buddhism and some of the other Indian religions. The other Indian religions, karma is produced from all actions. In Buddhism, karma is produced only from intentional actions. That's why meditation is so important, because intentional actions arise from our mind and not from anything else. We intend to do something, then karma arises. So classifications according to karma, there's four classifications according to function, priority of effect, time of taking effect, according to the place of taking effect. I'll go through this a bit more in detail. Okay, according to function, the first one is reproductive karma. In other words, this is the karma, the main karma brought over from our past life, which enables us to be born in this human realm, which dictates most of the conditions of our karma in this life, whether we have good lives, whether we have bad lives, whether we are born healthy, whether we are born sick, whatever the case may be. So this is the main karma which we bring over from our past life. The other karma is supportive karma. So supportive karma is some other more minor karma. In other words, this will add to the main karma of our this life. So if we did quite a lot of uh, good things in our previous lives, not necessarily just the past life, but from our previous lives, that may enhance or help our present life. So for example, in the business which we mentioned about just now, maybe from some previous supporting karma, this business has some new deals, has some good stuff which helps the business to prosper. So this is what we may term supportive karma. Obstructive karma is the difference of supportive karma. In other words, some of the more minor negative karma brought over from our past lives which may obstruct the good karma which we have brought over from the past life. So this may be obstructive to our present life conditions. The last one, according to function, is destructive karma. That means this is a very serious karma brought over from our past life, which negates our major karma. That's why like some people you see, they, they may die early, or their business fails for no reason or other. It may be due to destructive karma. Then some people so healthy, suddenly they develop a serious illness, 
it may be due to destructive karma and that ends their life. These are the four types of karma according to function. Another classification of karma is the priority of effect. That means which karma takes effect first, which karma has priority in dictating the conditions of our life. The first one is weighty karma. So this is a very serious or heavy karma from our previous life or even in this present life. So in Buddhism, there's five types of karma which lead you to an immediate rebirth in hell. All right. So no stopping at go, no stopping anywhere, straight to hell. So these five negative karmas are you injure a Buddha, you kill an Arahant, an Arahant is an enlightened person. So you injure a Buddha, you kill an Arahant, you kill your mother, you kill your father, you create divisions in the Sangha or within the monastic community. So in Buddhism, these are the five extremely serious or heavy karma lead to immediate rebirth in hell. So you can't escape from this karma if you kill your father or your mother or any of the other three conditions. Huh? Question. Yes. How about those abandon their parents? What do you mean those abandon their parents? Like because they are old, they create burden to the family, yeah? and then the children just ignore them or just kind of run away. Like. Okay. 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 So this brother asked, how about what about the people or people who abandon their parents, that leave their parents one side and um, just put them in the homes and never see them again, or something like that? Huh? So I guess that is really very serious karma. This is not as serious as weighty karma, like, because they did not really go and kill their parents. Maybe it is something very close to that, like, because in Buddhism, the Buddha also taught us that we must have a great deal of filial piety for our parents because it's our parents that brought us into this life. So no matter what, we should try our best to take care of them as much as possible. So for people who abandon their parents in this life, I think their karma will be quite serious uh, because in their this life, maybe their kids also abandon them or who knows, maybe in their future life they have to face the same thing. So it is um, serious but it may not be weighty karma. Uh. So this is the type of karma which you cannot escape from. Uh. Okay, that's the negative aspect of weighty karma. You know, you kill your father, you kill your mother, you injure a Buddha, you kill an arahan, you create a schism in the Sangha. The positive weighty karma is you are able to acquire very high attainments in meditation. So it's not just the ordinary meditations, but extremely high states of meditation we call jhana states. I will explain all these terms when we go into our lesson in meditation. So if you're able to attain very high states of meditation, you will be reborn in a very high heavenly realm. Now. So straight away, if you're able to attain those states and you're able to maintain those states during the process of dying, you'll be reborn in a high heavenly realm. Okay, so that's the one type of karma which you generally do not escape from. The next one which takes precedence is called proximate karma. So this is the karma which takes place just before you die. Theravada Buddhism, this refers to our thoughts at our death. So during death, if you have a lot of negative thoughts, well, that may lead you to a negative rebirth. If you have a lot of positive thoughts, that may lead you to a positive rebirth. But having said that, this will still be subject to your karma. So even though a person who has done a lot of good things, when he's dying, he may, be, he may have some negative thoughts, does not mean that all his good deeds, all his good karma is washed away. It still means that the likelihood of a good rebirth are still very high. So conversely, a person has done a lot of bad things throughout his life. During his death, he may have a comfortable death, peaceful death. But the chances are, when he dies, he will remember all these bad things and then likely to lead to a bad rebirth also. So the point is that this proximate karma is determined by the period close to our death. So how do we overcome this? So we just need to do more good things and so on, avoid bad things. So less chance of this proximate karma affecting you in a negative way. But this I will cover in the 10th lesson when we do the subject, how to face death. So I will go into that into quite a bit of detail, how to face death. So we have weighty karma, proximate karma, habitual karma. Habitual karma is a karma which we do generally during the course of our life. So in this life, we do a lot of good things, maybe a few bad things. This will be the karma which will determine our next rebirth. If we do a lot of bad things, we just do a few good things, that is our habitual karma that will take priority 
determine our next rebirth. Highly is the reserve karma. That means if we do not have much of all these, then it's the reserve karma uh, which has been accumulated from our previous lives. That means the reserve karma comes from our previous lives. Not necessarily our present life, but from the previous lives. So weighty karma is a really serious karma. Proximate karma is a karma close to our death. The habitual karma is most of the karma which we have accumulated during this life. And if these three do not take effect, then it's the reserve karma, the reserve karma from our previous lives, which will determine the rebirth in our next life. So for example, like the sister brought a question just now about the baby dying after maybe one or two years. So likely, as I mentioned, this is the karma which will take effect to determine the next destination for the baby. La. Because the baby obviously does not have the chance to, to do any weighty karma, no proximate karma, no habitual karma. So the reserve karma will determine the conditions of the next rebirth for that little baby. La. Okay, time of taking effect. Immediately effective karma. This means the karma taking effect in this life. As I mentioned just now, you have a lot of people, well, Generally, uh, people will help you back. Uh. You do harm to a lot of people. Well, generally, some people are bound to do you harm back. Uh. So this is the immediately effective karma. And also, when you do a lot of good things, that in itself is the reward. Because when you do a lot of good things, your mind is clear, your mind is peaceful. When you do a lot of bad things, your mind is never at peace. You're always agitated. You're fearful. So that in itself is a immediately effective negative karma of doing bad things. Your conscience affects you, you are worried what's going to happen to you. So subsequently effective karma means the karma which will affect you in the next life. So immediately effective karma is this life, subsequently effective karma is the next life. And indefinitely effective karma means the karma which will follow you throughout all your existences, throughout all your rebirths. That means if the karma doesn't take effect in this life or the next life, it will become indefinitely effective karma which will follow you throughout the rest of your lives, throughout your existences. And finally, there is defunct karma. Defunct karma usually means the karma of the Buddha or the enlightened people, the Arahants. Because after they become enlightened, they do not have a rebirth anymore. They have attained Nibbana, they have attained enlightenment. So the previous karma does not take effect anymore. So that becomes defunct karma. So for all of us here, what we are more concerned with is immediately effective karma. Because this life is what counts. We don't want to really worry so much about the next life. We do good things, we do it for this life. And also of course, a bit for the next life. But what really counts is this life. So place of taking effect. This is a big technical concerning all the planes of existence. In Buddhism, we have the six realms of existence broken up into the 31 planes of existence. There will be a lesson specifically on this subject a few weeks from now. So, just to run through, basically, there's immoral karma and then there's moral karma. And there's the sense here, the form sphere, the formless sphere. The sense sphere refers to our human existence and to the lower existence, the hell, animal, spirit, and this uh, so-called Asura realms and to some of the heavenly realms. The reason why we call them the sense here is because all beings born into these realms of existence have the six senses in full. So if you have immoral karma, if you do bad things, you will be reborn in the lower sense sphere. In other words, the animal realms, hell realms, Asura realms, the spirit realms. If you do good things, you will be reborn in the higher sense spheres, the human realm, and some of the heavenly realms. The form sphere means a higher heavenly realm, and the former sphere means an even higher heavenly realm. Again, I will cover this in detail when we go through the 31 planes of existence lesson. So this basically is just saying that your karma will lead you to these different realms of existence, that's all. Okay, any questions? Okay, for pets, are animals subject to rebirth? Do animals produce karma? Very good question. Thank you for asking. Okay.
okay, all beings produce karma to a certain level. It depends on the being. Humans obviously reproduce karma which affects our rebirth. Even animals, I think you can see for yourself, some cats and dogs, higher animals, horses, they are extremely intelligent. Even pigs, pigs are known to be as intelligent as dogs. So animals, it's difficult for them to produce good karma, right? Because they do not really have the opportunity. And also, they must be of a certain intelligence because if you see those small animals, fish, uh, insects, this and that, how are they going to produce karma? Difficult, right? But higher animals, they cannot. I mean, you can see these dogs, they help the blind. Cats, they even comfort those uh, sick and dying people. So animals can produce karma, not necessarily they cannot. So if they are in a situation whereby they can produce at least a certain amount of good karma, they can be reborn in a human realm. But not easy. Lah. That's why we say, try to maintain your morality at least in this life. Don't do so many bad things. Do more good things. Because if you drop below this human realm, lah, it is quite difficult to emerge from it. Lah. So animals do produce karma. Animals also are reborn. And all beings in these planes of existence are reborn. Lah. So I'll, I'll show this again in the next session on Dependent Origination. So I hope I answered your question. Okay, so what does karma and rebirth explain? People have always wondered about the fairness of life and why everybody is not born equal. People usually ask, why is one person so healthy and another born with many physical afflictions? I'm sure you know some people are born with uh, sometimes even genetic illnesses from birth already. They have to suffer so much. Why? And then why is this person born so healthy? Why? And why is one person born into a wealthy family, another person born into abject poverty? Why one person born in, for example, Singapore, good life, another person born into, let's say, uh, those extremely poor parts of India, suffering life, or even some parts of the Middle East, every day fighting, 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 killing, killing, killing. Why? And some people born into Switzerland, beautiful place. Why some people are able to enjoy a long and happy life? Why some people have their life cut short by violence or accident? Buddhists believe that these inequalities are not because of, as I mentioned in the first slide, are not because of random events, not because of luck, not because of faith, not because of the will of the God, it's because of karma. So karma is actually able to explain all these differences in people's lives because all these people, rich, poor, healthy, sick, long life, short life, these are the results of their previous karma. So the Buddha saw three things on the night of his enlightenment. The first thing he saw was his countless past lives. So this means that there are past lives according to Buddhism, according to the Buddha. He has seen his countless past lives. There are many, 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 many past lives. He also saw how beings arise and pass away and arise again according to their karma. So if you follow Buddhism, if you believe in the teachings of the Buddha, these are the two things which you may want to take account of. That number one, there are many lives. That there is rebirth, as you saw in the first part of the lesson. It's not just one life, but there are many, many, many lives. And also, that beings arise and pass away and arise again according to their own karma, not according to destiny, fate, God, luck, whatever the case may be. So these are the two things of the three things. The third things, of course, the Buddha realized the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is the way how we can attain enduring peace and happiness. Because once we understand the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, we understand the teachings of Buddhism, we know about karma, we know about past lives, our lives will be better and better and better. So this is something which you all want to think about. If you want to know what kind of life you led in your past life, look at your present life. You don't need to go and see fortune teller or all that so much. You want to know about your past life? Look at your present life. What are the conditions you have now? Is your life comfortable? You have a good family? You have enough to eat? You are sitting here comfortably listening to a Dharma talk? This is because of your past life. A lot of it is due to what you have done in your past life. I mean, if you have done a lot of bad things, would you be sitting here? Would you be enjoying a nice, comfortable life? No way, right? So you want to know what is your past life? See your conditions of your present life now. And you want to know what kind of life you have in your present life? See your life now. You do a lot of good things or not? You do a lot of bad things or not? 
You do a lot of bad things, sure your next time will be no good. You do a lot of good things, sure your next time will be good. So it all comes down to this life. The present life. This is what counts. Don't worry too much about the past life. Do what you can now. And then what you do in your present life will dictate what you will enjoy or suffer in your next life. This is all comes down to karma, your actions, what you do in this present life.